Thank you so much Evernote for sponsoring this video. Hey, welcome back to my channel. My name is Catherine, and today we're gonna walk through some tips of how to be more efficient as a software engineer. How can you do your work more quickly, more efficiently, and correctly? There are lots of different ways to write code, even different software engineering jobs, but the foundation of everything is problem solving. The first step in problem solving is usually asking questions. Asking questions about the problem, asking questions about different solutions, asking how things are integrated or tied together so that you can solve the problem. Now, in order to do your job efficiently, one of the most important things you can do is ask good questions. And some people might say there's not a stupid question. And while that may be true, there are certain questions you can ask that are better than others. And by better, it means it's a question that's gonna get you the answer you're looking for. If you ask a really broad question, then you're probably gonna get a broad response. If you ask a question that's like, what is AWS? Or how do I use AWS? You're probably gonna get a link to a tutorial or a link to the website. You won't really get what the answer you're looking for, which maybe it's how do I create a Lambda function or how do I add this specific configuration to one of my AWS resources? In asking a good question, you wanna add a good amount of context. This could be about the problem you're solving. It could be solutions you've already tried and that have failed. By adding a lot of context, you can essentially weed out other answers. If you've already done the Hello World tutorial and you say that with the link, then the person's not gonna respond with that same link. Although that has happened to me, usually it won't happen. If you add a lot of context, you're likely going to get closer to the answer you're looking for. Usually as you're writing code or trying to figure out the feature you're going to add, you run into errors along the way and each error is really a step to your solution. Same thing goes with asking these questions and trying to figure out what you're supposed to build. This means in order to ask a good question, you should do some research beforehand actually try solving the problem. If you're so stuck you really don't know where to start, then I would suggest looking at a given team's wiki page. They might have a website, they might have a page with a set of their documentation or their APIs or the tools they produce. Look at that first, come up with some questions, and then from there you can continue on and ask someone if you do get stuck. The problem with asking a broad question is it's gonna take you longer to get to your solution. It's also gonna annoy people because a lot of the times when you ask a broad question, you're asking someone else to do a majority of the work. No one wants to answer your question if they have to do a bunch of work. If you give them a lot of context and make the question as easy to answer as possible, they're more likely to answer it. This means it'll be faster to get to your solution and faster to get to that next step in your problem. Another thing that's important as a software engineer is to use your debugger. Some people try to debug or figure out the problems with their code by using print statements. And while that will work, it's not the most efficient way to debug your code. If for some reason your code takes five minutes to compile, this means anytime you want more information about a given variable or more information about the control flow of your code, you have to add code and recompile it every time. With a debugger, you can just run it and then step through your code and see what's actually going on. The debugger will also give you a lot more information than your print statement. Your print statement is probably just hi or hello or this block not the other block and that'll get you one piece of information about how your code is working the debugger gives you way more information so let's say the beginner uses print statements to debug and then you have the intermediate engineer that uses the debugger but then you have the senior engineer, the tech lead, and they'll actually use monitors and the debugger. So the debugger will tell you how your code works and what's being read in, how is it being parsed, what are the results of various lines of code, but monitors actually look into the efficiency, how efficient is the code you've written, both in memory and runtime, but that's like 1% of developers and that's too much work. If the code works and I understand it, 
I'm sure it's fine. Now to work efficiently as a software engineer, you need to have a system. We create systems to solve problems, to log stuff, to make things more efficient. So if we want to work more efficient, we need a system in order to do that. Now some software engineers don't take notes. And I used to be one of these engineers. I would keep it in my mind if I'm a problem solver, I don't have to memorize stuff and write stuff down. I can just look it up and solve the problem. The issue with that is that sometimes finding why that bug happened three months ago is somewhere deep in Jira or deep in some other tool and finding it is difficult. The process of searching for something ends up being so incredibly long that by the time you find the thing you're looking for, it's no longer useful, it's no longer relevant. So I'm gonna show you how I take notes as a software engineer and keep track of everything so that when my manager asks me for something, I have it. Recently, I've been using this service called Evernote Professional. It's a pretty interesting tool. Thank you Evernote for sponsoring this video. And there is a ton of content I'm able to pack into this system. I have my calendar here in the middle. This is my homepage. I have the different tasks I have to do. So I have to review Teddy's PR, which is essentially a pull request, his code for review. So reviewing Teddy's code. Uh, we have this bug that I need to look into and figure out what's going on. There's this service that we use within our code base that's being decommissioned. And so that's another task. And then I also have to set up some interview questions we're hiring. And typically with tasks, they're kind of, you check them off, you do them, you put them away. And it doesn't really matter when they happen. And I would say that's 90% of the tasks you do. It does not matter if I review Teddy's PR today, tomorrow, next week. I have to do it soon. But these two are kind of interesting tasks because when we fix this bug, it would be really interesting to know the timeline of when that bug happened. And so we can do this by when I, whenever I finish this task, I can put it in as a due date of like, okay, we solved the bug. Same thing for this decommissioning service. It would be really great to know when we move over to the new service, whatever our plan is. And you might be thinking, why does that matter? Well, if there's ever an issue with our service, our software service, understanding the dates of when things happened can help you eliminate what might be the problem. If the analytics issue wasn't happening during this outage, then we can remove that as a possibility of it contributing to the problem. And then to add a new task, I can just go here, add my task, and that's pretty great. Calendar, kind of easy, right in the middle here. Product folks always want a meeting, so we have that on the calendar. And what's really cool about Evernote is I could actually create a note for the event. If we click this, it's gonna bring me into a notes page. It'll, I'll know exactly what the meeting was. I can write down the action items and the notes. And typically, I would put this into like my product meetings notebook. And so a notebook is just a way to organize some of your stuff. We're gonna move it over to product meetings. And here, let's say, like maybe like an enum needs to be changed to include a new status. So maybe it's a new status for a given account, a new account type status. Maybe that's an action item. And maybe it's not actually creating the enum, it could just be creating the user story for it. And this is where I would just write a bunch of stuff down, and then when I'm done with the meeting, I can kind of categorize these notes and put them into their specific initiatives. So let's say we were working on this notification service. We would take some of those notes and put them in something like here. Typically when I'm trying to search for something and answer someone's question, typically it's not about the date that i'm searching for like i'll know more about the topic than about the date it happened so i typically like to organize my notebooks by topic because your manager won't ask you about what did we do in july they'll probably ask you when did we deploy the new notification service or something like that it's typically organized like we talk to each other communicate based on topics and not on timelines but everyone wants to know the date 
specific thing happened. And so let's talk about what notes you might have as a software engineer. So typically one note I'll have is something about the architecture. So let's say we have a notification service that basically helps with the different notifications on different platforms. And so you could be notified via text message, through email, through a push notification. Maybe we have a bunch of different apps we're working with. Let's say this is a service that handles that. There's lots of different systems that are required to create a notification. Maybe there's a bunch of checks that need to be done in order to enable email or to enable text message. And by creating the service, the notifications would be consistent across the different types. So typically when I'm creating an architecture, I'll write out the different problems we're trying to solve and what our, our idea, the ideal world would be purely thinking about requirements, not so much about technologies. And then after that, I'd be like, okay, does a functional type service make sense? Does it make sense to write code and put it on a server and manage the server? Does it make sense to just have a queue? Once we have the re requirements and the problems we're trying to solve, then we can start thinking about what technologies do we want to apply in order to solve the problem. Another note I might have in my notebook is anytime there's a bug or a big software decision that's made, I typically create a special note for it. And that's because everyone always asks about the bugs. How did we solve the analytics issue? And we can actually go up here and search whatever it might be. We can easily search for the given topic. So having a note about the bug can be really useful. You can talk about the timeline, you can talk about what went wrong, how you solved it, next steps, who you talked to, who were your contacts. In software engineering, as you move up, it's way more about the why you do things than the what happened. Why? did we have an analytics issue? Why did we move from X platform to Y platform? It's not so much about how you actually wrote the code because that's, you can Google that. It's more about why are you making the software decisions or the architectural decisions you're making and what are the impacts of those? What was the trade-off of doing this versus this? That Those are the things you wanna take notes on as a software engineer. Another note I'll have in my notebook is typically like things to do. So what are the different things I've done for this notification service initiative? And you can actually assign these to people. So if you're more of a delegator than a doer, that can be pretty great too. Another thing I like to use my notes for are creating or planning the different user stories that might be required for a given initiative. Every initiative that's software-based will have these four components. You'll have to write some kind of code that does the task you want the initiative or the service or whatever it is to do. You'll have to create the infrastructure, so that's the server either on premise or in the cloud or a serverless thing. Then you'll have to put it in production so you'll have your dev or integration environments, maybe it's called a staging environment. Typically you'll have at least two environments for your software service. And then you'll need to make sure you have visibility into the service. So the service is working, the service has visibility, so if we do get errors, we know what they are and our service has the capacity in order to accept traffic. Another thing that I kind of included in my head in write code is authentication. If there's security, that is another thing you'll probably have to write user stories for. User stories are just little tasks. So let's say we've figured out the requirements, we know what type of infrastructure we're gonna use, we have an architecture, then I would start writing some of the user stories. And so, like let's say this was a Lambda-based service, and so it's a serverless service. For this write code portion, the first step in that would be creating a hello world type app with a GitHub repo. This is pretty broad. We could, you know, create all these different little stories. These might be the acceptance criteria for when this task is complete. Now to create a new note, we can just go add notes and 
there are actually a lot of different things like we saw kind of a little bit of the to-do list but there are lots of different things you can put in the note and they also have templates you can use if you're a little bit more into front end that's great I typically go for a more simplistic approach but these are great if you want different ideas on how to organize some of your notes what works best for me is something like this where there's a title and there are very clear sections that sometimes they're questions sometimes they're just statements. We kind of saw it here with this bug template. There's a timeline, there's what went wrong, how we solved it, and these typically map up to things other people in the team might ask or might want to know. In fact, you can actually create your own templates, like this is my bug template, so we'll put that in here, and it kind of fills this out like this. And by using the template, I'm already ready to document a new bug. And there's actually a lot more templates in the template gallery, so you can put in project management, school, whatever it is. I can actually add a tag to this bug. So add it to the bugs tag. And then I can search through all of the different bugs that I've ever encountered and see how I've solved them. This is pretty good for interviews as well. If you need to freshen up on the different software issues you've solved, you know, that common question of whenever have I solved a bug, this tool can be pretty useful for that. And that's the really important thing about notes. Notes are way more for being able to look back than helping you in the moment. Sure, they might help you remember stuff, but for me, the system of note taking is way more about documenting. Your notes are your own documentation. And so keeping that in mind, you wanna make them specific. It's like when you have a really bad git commit message and it says okay, or it says done, or it's something that's not very useful. Your notes will only be as useful as you make them. Now, if you have some people that you join the meeting and they just start talking, you can use the scratch pad. This is also on my homepage along with some pinned notes. Those are coming from the notebooks and some tags so I can look into the bugs tag or product, AWS, these might be others. Just like data structures, it's not so much if you have the data, it's can you retrieve the data efficiently? How easy is it to retrieve and to store? And a tool like this makes both of those tasks pretty easy to do. All right, that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Happy 